Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Heinrichs, and I'm a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. Hudson is a research organization promoting American global leadership for security, freedom, and prosperity. I'm also the director of Hudson's Keystone Defense Initiative. Our mission at KDI is to help educate, assess, and sharpen policies, strategies, and programs to strengthen the credibility of U.S. strategic deterrence. This is especially important as we navigate what I have assessed uh, is a Cold War with China, who is increasingly collaborating in various ways with the Russians, Iranians, and North Koreans. Please do subscribe to the monthly KDI newsletter. It is with this purpose in mind that we are here to discuss America's new strategic bomber, the B-21 Raider. We have requested that our experts who are here with us today to assess various aspects of the B-21 program. Hudson will be publishing the compilation of essays next month, just in time for you to bring yours home uh, for the holidays. With me here to discuss some of the highlights and themes of their assessments are Rebecca Grant with IRIS Independent Research, Chris Bowie, Center for Strategic and Budget Assessments, Jennifer Bradley, U.S. Strategic Command, Carrie Bingen, Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Mackenzie Eaglin with the American Enterprise Institute. Each scholar is representing herself and himself and does not represent uh, necessarily or speak on the behalf of the associated organizations. With that brief introduction, I'm going to turn the floor over to each person to provide some opening remarks. And with that, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca. As you know, on November 10th, the B-21 made its first flight. And that test article is expanding its envelope in a world that looks very different from when this program began back in the 2010s. Let me tell you a quick story. On the night of October 24th, an American B-52H bomber was flying over the Pacific when a Chinese J-11 fighter buzzed it and came within 10 feet of that aircraft. That was really a brush with death for that B-52 crew. And it reminds us that we are now living in a world where Chinese aggressive military activity and China's nuclear modernization has significantly changed the security environment. So the B-21 Raider needs to be ready to operate in a two-peer conflict environment. I'd like to make a couple points about what that means, particularly for the fleet size of the B-21. So as you know, bombers are used against a number of different targets and the B-21 will really be the only one with the range and stealth to go over against the most difficult targets like Chinese mobile missiles or whatever hardened and deeply buried targets rogues and adversaries may present. So as we look at the size of this fleet, understand that the buy number of 100 was really set to keep the program within a certain dollar amount in order to get it started. A hundred bombers for the B-21 was never actually the analysis of what was needed. And I'd argue now that we're in a case where we're going to need even more. One way to understand that is to look at some of the potential campaign target sets for a B-21 if it comes to a wartime scenario. And these include things like airfield attack. That's always a basic task of gaining enough workable air superiority to carry out operations. And let me point out that we think China has somewhere between about 65 and 150 military airfields. That's a huge number when you think of even a few sorties needing to go against those airfields to suppress Chinese sortie generation. I wanna just list off a couple other types of target sets that show you how big the requirement for B-21s could be in planning a major theater conventional operation. Those target sets might include things like mobile missiles, conventional or nuclear. Of course, they're going to include going after air defenses to establish corridors of air superiority. A new category here is possibly going to be space launch facilities or things like ground-based weapons that can reach up to our satellites in space. And as always, we'll ask bombers to go after command and control of integrated air defenses and control of military operations against an adversary. Another category will be ships. 
don't often think about this one, but as a conflict gets underway, we have to remember that China's Navy, for example, right now is bigger than ours. And hearkening back to World War II, we saw a lot of success of bombers used against maritime targets. I'd say look for those again. Beyond that, of course, they're gonna be the hardened and deeply buried targets, and then any sort of rogue target sets, whether that's terrorist training camps or something that we can't even envision at this point, where we need a stealthy, long range platform that can loiter, get immediate target updates, cope with the electronic warfare environment, and then go and hit a range of targets very precisely. So we're counting on the B-21 to do all that, and I think that makes a pretty strong case for looking at an ultimate buy of more than 100. And then hearkening back to my story about the B-52 at the beginning, I wanna say I think it's time for the Air Force to bring back attrition reserve, which is a phrase we never hear much, but it used to be that the Air Force always bought a combat fleet with about 10 to 15% extra numbers of airframes to account for operational accidents and yes, for combat losses. So let's consider that as we look at what we need for the B-21. I'm really encouraged to see that the B-21 has made its first flight and I'm gonna predict it moving to combat capability pretty quickly since it's flown as a production representative article. So our challenge is gonna to be to size that fleet appropriately for the two peer threat. And to my mind, that means on planning, on buying at least 100 and probably more of the B-21 Raider. That ends my remarks, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Chris, over to you. So the, the B-21 will enter service over the coming years to become the backbone of the U.S. long-range bomber fleet and a product of U.S. organizational, technical, and operational prowess. These aircraft underpin the United States' position as a superpower due to their capabilities to deter conventional aggression and nuclear war. Although uh, long-range bombers were originally the primary system we used to deter nuclear attack in the Cold War, we've employed them in multiple conventional conflicts over the past seven decades. The advent of adverse weather precision weapons in the 1990s enabled planners to take better advantage of the bomber's large payload, as we've seen demonstrated in multiple conflicts over the last three decades. So this heightens the importance of the B-21 which like its forerunner, the B-2, provides a revolutionary combination of range, speed, payload, and stealth. No other system provides this unique combination of attributes to execute conventional power projection operations and deter two near-peer adversaries, Russia and China. B-21s operating from the United States can strike anywhere on the planet with ours in response to surprise attacks, or they can be forward deployed to rear area bases to send signals of concern during a crisis. Its stealth and range allow it to threaten multiple axes of attack, complicating an adversary's defensive challenge. It can deliver a wide variety of munitions, large penetrating weapons to strike hardened facilities, large quantities of smaller precision weapons, and as Rebecca has highlighted, potentially anti-ship missiles and even air-to-air -air missiles. The aircraft's stealth characteristics pose a very formidable problem for our adversaries. The U.S. revealed in the 1990s that the B-2 featured the radar signature of an insect. The B-21, using computer-aided design and new surface treatments, should feature an even smaller signature. Overall, the B-21's unique combination of range, payload, speed, and stealth enable it to hold a wide variety of targets at risk across the large land masses of China and Russia's. These capabilities are critical to conventional deterrence. Now, bombers also form the air-breathing leg of the nuclear triad. They work in synergy with land-based and submarine-based ICBMs to generate a retaliatory capability that no adversary could hope to nullify. The bomber leg provides some valuable capabilities to the triad. It is the primary leg we employ to send unmistakable messages during a crisis by generating the force and dispersing it to multiple bases. It is the only leg that can rapidly increase the number of warheads on alert, 
a capability that will become more critical as we enter this tripolar nuclear world. And the bomber leg poses a significantly different threat profile, preventing adversaries from concentrating on ballistic missile defense alone. Now, the B-21's value in deterring conventional aggression and nuclear conflict indicates, as Rebecca has highlighted, that we should plan to build more than the 100 currently on the books. No matter how capable an aircraft, it can only be in one place at one time. B-21s prosecuting conventional attacks would not be available to stand nuclear alert. This would generate significant dilemmas for our nation's leader in the time of war. Do you pull aircraft out of theater to bolster our nuclear deterrent posture? Or do you degrade the triad in order to increase operational tempo in conventional operations? A larger force would provide our leaders with more options and bolster our conventional and nuclear deterrent capabilities. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. And uh, another aspect of this particular challenge is um, how uncomfortable, how nervous our allies are um, as the uh, both the Chinese and the Russians uh, continue to threaten uh, their expansionist aims. And so the United States has to pay close attention to assuring our allies. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to Jennifer to talk to us a little bit about what the B-21 can do for increasing the credibility of assurances. Jennifer? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm going to reiterate today that my remarks are my own and do not re represent U.S. Strategic Command, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Today, I'm going to speak about the impact of the B-21 Raider on extended deterrence and assurance of our allies. For more than seven decades, the United States alliances with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Australia, Japan, and the Republic of Korea have been key pillars of U.S. US security strategy. Based on mutual values, common interests, and a shared threat perspective, these symbiotic relationships contribute to global stability and prosperity. The security guarantees that the United States provides these allies are underscored by extended nuclear deterrence, which is made credible by U.S. nuclear capabilities. The 2022 Nuclear Posture Review affirmed these commitments, stating that the U.S. would ensure our strategic deterrent remains safe, secure, and effective, and our extended deterrence commitments remain strong and credible. Preventing nuclear proliferation has been and remains a key policy priority of the United States, and the policy of extended deterrence contributes to this by removing the need for allies to obtain their own nuclear deterrent. The nations of NATO, Australia, Japan, and South Korea have forsworn nuclear weapons, entering the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as non-nuclear states while entrusting the United States to deter nuclear attacks on their territory and people. Each of these allies have reaffirmed their reliance on and the importance of extended deterrence in their strategy documents. However, as adversaries rely more on nuclear weapons, not just to defend themselves, but to achieve objectives through coercion, many longtime U.S. allies share a growing concern with the credibility of Washington's extended deterrence. China, Russia, and North Korea have made nuclear weapons a prominent part of their respective security strategies. Since the most plausible possible scenario for the use of nuclear weapons is a regional conflict that escalates to limited nuclear use, allies under the U.S. nuclear umbrella find themselves on the front lines against the threat posed by these adversaries. U.S. allies' anxiety, therefore, grows in proportion to their concern about the credibility of extended deterrence. This anxiety contributes to a growing assurance gap among U.S. allied nations. Where deterrence aims to instill caution in an adversary, assurance strives to reassure an ally. However, an ally perceives its security situation, how an ally perceives its security situation matters greatly in measuring the effectiveness of assurance. While deterrence has often been described as the threat that leaves something to chance, bolstering assurance requires maintaining high levels of certainty and credibility as allies are justifiably unwilling to leave their security to chance. Closing the assurance gap with allies is an imperative for the health of the United States alliance relationships and the longevity of its nuclear nonproliferation and the longevity of the nuclear non 
non-proliferation regime. The B-21 Raider has unique attributes that directly address this assurance gap. The B-21 will have global reach, can carry both nuclear and conventional munitions, and possesses stealth capabilities that allow it to penetrate an adversary's air defenses. As a deterrent, it is both credible and lethal. Unlike the other two legs of the nuclear triad, however, the capabilities of the B-21, its persistence in theater, its visibility, and its viability in combined operations with allies make it uniquely suited for conducting missions that bolster U.S. assurance. First, its persistence in theater. The B-21 will have global range and be able to loiter in theater without needing to be stationed in theater. Not having to be stationed in theater removes the requirement to station nuclear weapons inside of allied territory, which is politically unpalatable for some allies, such as Japan. Plus, it will be capable of enco encompassing a high number of targets with both conventional and nuclear munitions, giving the United States increased flexibility, while also assuring allies that the U.S. can move significant force into theater if a given security environment deteriorates. Second, its visibility. The strategic bomber is traditionally the most visible leg of the nuclear triad. While its visibility is often described as a way to signal to adversaries during times of crisis or conflict, it is also essential for signaling U.S. commitment to allies during day-to-day -day operations. This is especially important with our Indo-Pacific allies who no longer have regionally deployed nuclear weapons. The B-21, therefore, will provide a visible demonstration of the United States' commitment in, to, its, to its extended deterrent guarantees to Australia, Japan, and South Korea. Finally, combined operations. While combined operations are impractical with intercontinental ballistic missiles or ballistic missile submarines, there is a realistic opportunity for allies to participate in bomber operations. Refueling is a critical component of long-range persistent bomber operations, and the ability of U.S. allies to participate in and contribute to these missions in this regard is mutually beneficial. It eases the demand on U.S. tanker capability while also also encouraging allies to be active participants in their own security. Allies could serve as forward basing options for bomber operations or as recovery and reconstitution leaders for completed bomber missions. These contributions could allow a higher number of mission sorties and increase the tempo of operations. All of this makes right sizing the B-21 force critically important, not only for enhancing the strategic deterrence capabilities of the United States, but also for assuring U.S. allies of Washington's commitment to extended deterrence. The existence of two nuclear peer adversaries in an unpredictable North Korea make this a difficult challenge and increases the demands on the U.S. strategic deterrent. The United States, therefore, has to be capable of deterring attacks in one theater while simultaneously responding to attacks in a different theater. This may dramatically increase the demands placed on the B-21 as the platform has the flexibility to accomplish both missions. It also risks turning the B-21 into a low-density, high-demand asset, but only if the United States fails to invest in sufficient numbers to, to fulfill its commitments to deterrence, extended deterrence, and assurance. I will wrap up with a quote from Winston Churchill. There is only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is fighting without them. Understanding the demands that will be placed on the B-21 for extended deterrence and assurance and sizing the force appropriately will help ensure the health of the U.S. alliance relationships for the next seven decades. Thank you, Jennifer. That was great. Carrie, over to you. Great, Rebecca, thanks so much for having us all. And it's uh, an honor to be a part of this panel uh, with so many experts in this area. So uh, my colleagues talked about force structure and the role of the B-21 in extended deterrence. I want to focus on how we complicate the adversary's decision calculus. Uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks gave a speech earlier this year. She wants Chinese leadership to wake up every day to consider the risks of aggression and to conclude today is not the day and neither is tomorrow or the day after. With the B-21 in the toolkit and its immense flexibility as my colleagues here have discussed, another aspect to consider is how does it create uncertainty for an adversary on the extent of our capabilities 
And how does it raise doubt about their own capabilities? How does it help complicate the adversary's calculus and ultimately strengthen our own deterrence? We want to keep China guessing. Can they really achieve their objective? Do they really want to take on the United States or the capabilities we have and the reach and the cost that we can impose on them? I will say not much information exists in the public domain about the B-21. That's a good thing, lest we give China and Russia any more lead time, given that they are already analyzing the heck out of it to look for vulnerabilities. So how can the B-21 help keep Xi and Putin guessing as to its capability and how it can be used? What else do we want them guessing on? And what hard problems do we want to create for them? Well, let's look at other bombers and the multifunctional ways we use them, from demonstrating the credibility of our nuclear deterrent force to conducting theater conventional operations. The B-2 in particular suggests a hard problem for our adversaries. And the B-21 stealth technology and other advanced technologies is over three decades beyond the B-2's technology. So a couple of things that, that we want our adversaries to be thinking about. They have to think about where is the B-21 coming from? Where is it coming from? A key operational benefit of a bomber, of this bomber, is its range and mobility. The B-21 has a lot of options, as my colleagues have discussed. Let's assume for a moment a range of 2,000 nautical miles or greater. A B-21 can access targets deep inside the Chinese mainland not just from the Pacific, but from the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. And it can do so from multiple axes of entry, flying from different and unconventional locations. We've seen bombers operate out of the UK, Guam, Diego Garcia. We saw the first B-52 landing in South Korea in decades this fall, the first ever B-52 deployment to Indonesia last summer, and the first B-1 landing in Poland in 2021. Second, what targets can it hold at risk with what munitions? The B-21 has an ability to conduct deep strike, deep strike into a mainland with nuclear, conventional, and even unconventional weapons beyond what beyond an ICBM. There are so there are an array of weapons that it can hold from nuclear, or it could hold, I should say, from nuclear gravity bombs and a standoff. A uh, standoff cruise missile to conventional from J dams, small diameter bombs, all the way up to JASMs and the the MOP, the massive ordnance penetrator. All of those could could theoretically or feasibly um, uh, uh, be within the the uh, within the range of of a B twenty one payload, and also unconventional. So think electronic warfare, for example. Um, there's an array of targets, as Rebecca discussed, that that could be reached from missile launch sites to airfield, command and control, military infrastructure. And I would also say that the B-21, the open architecture that has been designed in from the start should also make it easier to adapt weapons and to integrate new ones as they come online. Third, I want our adversaries worried about how is, how is it used? Bombers have shown their flexibility in carrying a wide array of munitions, including other service weapons, and also conducting an array of missions. It was discussed uh, previously, the B-1, the B-52 have maritime strike capabilities where they can carry anti-ship cruise missiles. Um, they could do mine laying. You could envision a, an air defense mission as well. Also, we've seen DOD emphasize new innovative operating concepts and new and explore new or different modes of operations. A recent example is the B-52 and the Strategic Capability Office, SCO's arsenal plane. As it's been reported, it was turning the B-52 into a flying launch pad for all sorts of different conventional payloads. I'd also offer uh, and, and, and ask folks to consider the announcement that the B-21 was designed from the outset for ease of maintenance, higher operational tempo, quicker turnaround. So what does that now afford us that the adversary has to think about? And then fourth, who is it used with? Let's look to these recent bomber task force missions and the various exercises that the bomber force has recently participated in. Nordic exercises, flights over the Baltics, trading with Poland, training in Turkey, uh, drills near the Korean peninsula with South Korea, with Japan, even exercises in Indonesia this past summer. Uh, a few final points I, I'd offer. Uh, you know, I am careful on not making the B-21 a panacea. It is an incredibly flexible platform. It creates dilemmas for our adversary. 
And it also gives options to a president. And I, and I want to emphasize this. It is a platform that provides options, nuclear, conventional, unconventional, that can hold mainland targets at risk and military forces supporting those operations, any operations against us, particularly conventional. We have nuclear, we have theater, tactical capabilities. We need more, I'll say strategic conventional options to hold at risk those hard and deeply buried targets targets, uh, missile launch sites, command and control, et cetera, um, that are out of range of our conventional strike aircraft, our cruise missiles. Now to, to hold those targets at risk, we rely on nuclear ballistic missiles. I think we owe it to a president to give him or her more options, including those below the nuclear threshold. And I think a B-21 gives us both, both nuclear options as well as conventional. And then last point I'd say is China is already questioning whether uh, America has the will to fund the B-21 at scale. And I think we need to prove them wrong there in terms of the numbers and the funding and the timelines to do that. Wonderful. Great. Thanks. Carrie, you've got me thinking about all the different threads I'm going to pull here in the next round um, where we can hopefully weave them together. Mackenzie, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about a little bit about how we've gotten um, the B-21 program in a, in a good place and how we might be able to learn some things um, from how we've done that. So the floor is yours. So the B-21 is remarkable insofar as it's a bipartisan success story where actual members of Congress are lauding it as sort of the poster child of acquisitions gone right. As we all know on this panel, that almost never happens. And it certainly doesn't happen on its own or by coincidence. Uh, this was very, this is a program that has been able to learn a lot of lessons from other, uh, not just programs before it, like Carrie talked about the B2 and lessons learned there with stealth and other coatings and maintenance, but also other acquisition failures like the Zoom Long, the DDG-1000, the expeditionary fighting vehicles and others. Uh, and part of, you know, so th there were a lot of contributing factors to why this program went from initial contract award to first flight in just about seven years, which is slow in the commercial space, uh, but in Pentagon dog years, that's like record time. And obviously in this particular case, you know, it's easy to dump all over the Pentagon acquisition system and I'm, I'm the first to do that. But when we're talking about something that will handle nuclear weapons, I'm okay with going a little bit slower and safer and more carefully, so, which would also makes that seven years a, a more remarkable time figure. But like I said, none of this is by accident and it didn't come easily. There were years at the Air Force leadership over various different chiefs because they, you know, rotate out, went toe to toe with the chairman and the formidable former chairman, uh, the Armed Services Committee, John McCain, uh, about, for example, um, uh, making this program unclassified, taking it, taking it's basically its secret specs, including funding and other profiles and technical details out of the black space and into the. The, the public domain, which would have been a terrible idea. And the Air Force leadership rightly pushed back on this. But that secrecy, now that doesn't mean no oversight, right? Uh, secrecy simply, it means different oversight. Uh, but that really helped lay the foundation for this program to have stability in requirements, which led to stability in its design so once everyone, if there's too many hands in the pot or cooks in the kitchen or pick your favorite metaphor, um, that's when programs typically go off the rails. And I watched this with the Zoom wall when I worked on Capitol Hill um, for a shipbuilding member. So this classification helped contribute to all of the, 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 that was not the only reason there was stability and requirements and then stability and design. And then lastly, there was a, um, active contract management with the customer and the corporation. And then finally Congress, right? So everybody had to be involved to make this program successful. If, if that is indeed what it is. And I think it, so far it's proving to be. And then Congress provided stability and funding. So based on the publicly available numbers of every request since fiscal year 2016, Congress has met those requests, which is significant because you, you look through any defense bill and any other program, there's all kinds of nicks and cuts and small haircuts and then deep uh, rescissions saying things are early to need and this and that as if, you know, no offense to our friends on the Hill, but as if, as if eight staffers can run, you know, a trillion dollar organization and, and know best. Sometimes they do, sometimes they do not. And so I 
these four uh, factors primarily contributed to what I what I think so far is a successful program. Having this run out of the Air Force's Rapid Capabilities Office contributed to that sort of lean chain of command that meant anybody who wanted to submit uh, input on making changes to the program as in two requirements by having fewer, um, fewer people involved meant any change had to be approved directly and personally by the Air Force Chief of Staff. That's pretty remarkable. The chiefs don't have time uh, to really deal with programs, but this one was too important. Obviously, we're all pretty familiar with the very inadequately sized B-2 fleet, the overworked B-51 fleet, but let's not forget the bone. The B-1 is out there, the workforce as well. Um, the, the predecessor to the Raider was canceled by Robert Gates when he was Secretary of Defense. There was no more time to mess around or to have more cancellations or more delays. This program is late to need. Uh, we needed the bomber flying in significant numbers 10 years ago, uh, but we are where we are. And so it, there just was no more time to mess around. And so that, I'd argue when the chief does have to pick his priorities, the chief four predecessors uh, to, to date, when he said that this, you know, this program will run through me, I think that was the right way for him to spend his time, given the many other demands on his time. Uh, and then lastly, like I said, active contract management. So this isn't just a pure fixed price or pure cost plus uh, program arrangement. This is one where the company wanted to share more risk. Programs that are really um, um, taking uh, gambles in technological development or new technologies or risky things like, I don't know, handling nuclear weapons. Uh, companies typically do want to share that risk with the government and that's more than appropriate. And in this case, um, it's beneficial. So yes, companies can make profit in development, but it also allows for fast failure. Uh, it allows for room for error and adjustment. And then you have more stable production later when you figure these, uh, work out these problems, challenges and kinks in development. And so active contract management where there's more flexibility in what contract is used when as decided by the Air Force and agreed to by the corporation, I think was um, pretty helpful. And that's probably going to be applicable to some other programs that are also late to need and coming online here soon. Not all of the reasons, Rebecca, that this program is succeeding, but those are just four or five I wanted to capture as some of the biggest contributors to stability. The, the, the most essential thing, however, is this sort of kumbaya, the ecosystem of stakeholders. Everybody had to be in on being committed to this program, going fast, and having stability. So Congress, um, the company, the customer, the Pentagon and Air Force leadership and everyone in between. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, while it's on my mind, one of the questions I do wanna ask, we, we've we heard um, from, from a couple different people that um, it's gonna be really, that the B-21 is gonna be really, really useful in this to, uh, nuclear near peer or peer environment. And so the timing on the one hand seems like it's like, great, it's going to enter production. And so we've got some options now we got to think about how many we need. But then Mackenzie, you just make brought up another point, which is that it's actually already late. And so it's, it's late to need, but, uh, but we're sort of at a decision point and, and we, and we as a country are really only now beginning to understand China's strategic nuclear breakout and, and the need to be able to handle these two peer environment. And so maybe, um, you know, we, we it's late, but at the same time, now, as we're beginning to think about this, we can think about now, how many we, do we need to buy? And is a hundred really the right number? As Rebecca pointed out, that number was really assessed, not, not just whenever we're just trying to figure out how to, to, to start the program, but in also in a different threat environment. Um, so I know Rebecca, do you want to talk about that too? Because when, when we conceived of this number, a hundred was really the floor, but it really, what we hadn't really totally grasped the nature of what we were going to need this aircraft to be able to do. Yes. Uh, the Air Force first said that it would be between 80 and 100 bombers. And as we've reminded ourselves, the, the key was to get the program started and the Air Force faced all kinds of opposition and questions. And one very intriguing element was some real uh, passion within uh, DOD to make it optionally manned. 
So getting to 100 and sticking on that number was very important. As we know, there's a, a pegged uh, unit flyaway cost. We'll go into the details. But I would say essentially this number has not been run through the standard calculation. It really is a number based on what the first tranche can do, what the first production run can do. And, and in fact, some of the first air vehicles were even funded in that program award contract. So you know, now is the time to look at this and say, uh, how many do we need? And to add attrition reserve and other things like I talked about, you know, you're really looking at a situation where you're going to want to have, as Chris and others pointed out, bombers on alert, um, but also ready to do conventional activity. And if we're in that very difficult scenario, that hardened, deeply buried target for conventional strike is not going to look that different from a potential low yield nuclear weapon strike should one be necessary. So the analysis, you know, it's time to do this analysis and why it's essential. The, um, the, the longtime program manager, you know, Randy Walton said a couple of years ago, sure, we can produce more, but you need to be able to get the long lead time to activate subcontractors and other um, means to set up that production. So it's a decision that there needs to be um, a very serious analysis done, I'd say within the next year tops saying, hey, this is the number that we're going for and let's tool up and fund to this profile that will really meet this two-peer threat and, and then go ahead and do the other things that you need that are always essential in a new program, whether that's any additional military construction, do you need an additional base beyond the three that have been discussed? Uh, do we want some of our allied air forces to operate some of these B-21s down the road, the RAF, the Royal Australian Air Force, other strong allies? put all that together and get a good, as Mackenzie pointed out, bipartisan decision. So, you know, Carrie, as you said, so that this fleet will really provide the credible options and not be ending up at the 21 airframes that we saw with the B-2. I want to tease out this uh, sort of more denser concept that each of us, I think, has touched on, which is, and Carrie really laid out um, the what we're really trying to do is give the president more options. Um, and we also want to uh, complicate the adversary's calculations. Okay. So that that's how, what, what that's what we're, we'd like to do with all these weapon systems, but the B-21 is uniquely suited to provide some of those um, attributes that can do those things. But I want to talk about this, this concept that we might be out of practice as analysts and talking in the public space as Americans about this need to, deter the conventional regional conflict so that we are not stepping down a path where a nuclear weapon may be considered. Um, so Chris, I'm going to ask you to, to kind of take a stab at this and, and flesh this out for us because we've gone back and forth a little bit with the B-21's nuclear mission, the strategic deterrence mission. And yet we've also talked about how we still want to be able to reach out and touch those deeply buried targets. We want the adversary to understand that we can do that. Um, we want it to have conventional payloads. And so it, it's going to have options to be able to, to put weapons on targets. So we're talking about a combat mission, but we also want to increase the credibility of deterrence. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you're thinking about those two um, subjects? And uh, basically what, what, what should receive uh, greater emphasis, the conventional or the nuclear or... Yeah, how conventional and nuclear, and how how they how they're symbiotic. How how having um the how you know being able to reach those targets actually bolsters the credibility of of the deterrent mission. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, obviously, you want to keep a conflict at the conventional level, and uh, I think the B twenty one has the potential to, you know, provide the deterrence. Um, that a uh, that that will need because it has the the capability to protect, for example uh, uh, Chinese crossing of the straits. Uh, you could think that a, a B twenty one could provide a lot of anti ship missiles, but very rapidly. And so the you know the real value of a strategic bomber like this is that it can reach out anywhere within hours. Everything else takes a long time to position, so it's very difficult to deal when uh, you're uh, responding in a crisis. Whereas uh, a system like the B-21 allows you to respond very quickly. And then in addition, as you've been pointed out, um, 
its range allows it to reach any target. And if you're going to deter an adversary, you want to be able to hold all targets at risk, that nothing is off limits. And uh, the B-21 provides that capability. Again, that combination of range, payload, and stealth is very unique and uh, I, I think could help contribute to conventional deterrence. And then also, and then I'm going to just ask this, but I'm going to turn over and talk about the ally question. I'm going to put this one out there so maybe you all can think about it and then you can um, just pitch in um, as you want to. But also this, as we're thinking about deterring one conflict with China and Russia, we want to deter both of them simultaneously. Deterrence breaks down in one theater. We want to continue to deter the other adversary from opportunistic aggression. So thinking about how the B-21 might be able to do that. So that's my one sort of tabled question. Um, the other question is about allies. What I really liked about what Jennifer said is she really kind of gave us a menu of options for how different allies might be able to contribute to this mission and why the B-21 might be attractive. So for Japan, um, Jennifer mentioned they might not want to host these things. But then I think um, Mackenzie or somebody or Carrie mentioned that maybe, um, or Rebecca, I don't know what you mentioned that maybe the Australians would want to hand help with the refueling mission or basing or something like that. So um, let's just talk about that. Talk about why and why it's the, the air. I mean, it's always been true of the air leg, but now we have this brand new next generation stealth strategic bomber. How let's talk about how how can our allies and just pick one that you're thinking about might want to think about B-21. Jennifer, you can add to anything else you've already said, um, but but flesh out how B-21 um might provide this in a way that you know the 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 sea based leg or land based leg just simply can't do thanks rebecca um so first just touching on your previous question of its contributions to conventional deterrence i think that is really important to our allies because they are trying to um contribute to that deterrent many times of what is an attack on their homeland. And so it's always tempting to segregate nuclear deterrence into its own bucket away from conventional deterrence. But those um, that strategic layer, that nuclear shadow, falls under all of those other um, adversary decisions as you back up the decision even to enter into a conflict. And so the more capable that the B-21 is for striking any um, sort of target inside of a country will put that sort of strategic shadow under all of these initial decisions that that adversary may be contemplating, and which is incredibly important to our allies, as again they are on that that front line of deterring that that initial conventional um, attack, and then. We also need to consider that there are those possibilities of a non-nuclear strategic attack. And so our uh, capabilities need, need to be able to have that sort of flexibility to respond to something that may reach the strategic layer, but may not be a nuclear attack. And so the B-21 may have the flexibility to provide the president with different options to be able to respond to something that's not, that is not necessarily a nuclear attack, but still reaches that level of a strategic um, attack on either the United States or our allies. And then as far as the the flexibility of being able to do combined operations, um, any time that you are able to better partner with the allies so that they have agency in their own defense, I think is a win because it demonstrates commitment as well as providing that assurance that, hey, we have the ability to, um, to reach out and to uh, address the different threats that are um, affecting both of our homelands together. And and I think that in and of itself, that working together um, during peacetime to be prepared for that crisis and conflict is so important when you think about um, assurance of our allies. Great. And anybody else can pitch in yet? Yeah, Carrie, go for it. So I actually want to pick up on this question that you've asked on the role of the B-21 in, con in a conventional or conventional to nuclear um, uh, conflict and then pick up on both what uh, Chris and, and Jennifer have been talking about. You, you, uh, 
just to remind folks, I mean, that the capability that China has in terms of its anti-access area denial capabilities is significant. You know, if you think about our force posture and our forces in the last 20 years of counterterrorism operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had complete air superiority. A conventional fight vis-a-vis -vis China over Taiwan is such a different beast. I just can't emphasize that enough. And oh, by the way, China is investing in an array of sensors and radars, air defenses, ballistic missiles. They have their own version of GMD, the ground-based uh, mid-course defense system. So you know, when I think about what our forces are up against in a scenario, it is incredibly challenging to penetrate that A2AD environment. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to have our hands full with trying to suppress their, their air defenses, our strike platforms, tactical strike platforms are going to have a hard time. If we use ballistic missiles, they're, it's a, a predictable trajectory. So you really are looking at capabilities like the B-21 with its stealth and its penetrability, and then you know maybe hypersonic uh, missiles as well that can maneuver around or, or through, uh, through radar fans. Um, so I think that the B-21 has immense value there. You know, the other thing I would say is um, short of those kind of conventional options, um, you're left with nuclear options, back to, you know, president's options, nuclear options with big yield warheads that are in our inventory that are our legacy weapons. Um, a nuclear decision by a president is such a big grave decision. And you want to give a president more options. You, you want nuclear options, but you want you also want to have conventional options to preserve that decision space for, you know, when 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 you're willing to cross the nuclear threshold. So I think the B-21 has a lot of flexibility both in those um in a in those kind of conventional penetrating roles as well as that that nuclear role. Great. Mackenzie. Our bomber fleet is old getting older and smaller every day. And it's right now, it's a blend of three different bombers. I already referenced them, the B-1, the B-52, and the B-2. The B-2 is like a minuscule fleet. But each one of these bombers has uh, different, in some cases overlapping, but for the most part, unique uh, capabilities that they bring uh, to provide options to presidents and commanders in chief and commanders, actual commanders. Uh, and they work together as a group. Uh, the challenge here is, of course, at the height of the Cold War, we had 400 bombers. Today, we're below 150. In the last mile of the bomber transition to the B-21, there has to be continuity. This is going to be a fleet that's a, a hybrid blend of old and new until the 2040s. So Chris called the B-21 the, uh, so Chris called the B-21's forerunner the B-2, but the B-21 will pick up missions from the B-1, the conventionally armed now B-1 as well as the B-2, which of course is nuclear capable, uh, performing a wide variety of tasks, and in some cases the B-52. So when you look at what is all that we're asking of it, we can't take our eye off the entire fleet of bombers and the need for all three of them to operate as long as they can without early retirements to extend service lives where we can. You know, the B-1 being is testing hypersonic weapons right now. That is a deterrent when we don't have much else in this realm that America chose to, to give up its lead on 20 years ago in terms of hypersonic weapons. That's important. Uh, the B-1, carry, it's the it carries more munitions than any other aircraft in the entire United States military inventory. So. The B-21 is essential. It's late. Its numbers are still too small relative to need, but it's going to fly alongside the B-1 and the B-52 for decades. And we have to consider these um, things holistically. And it still doesn't mean there's enough B-21s. It just means um, this is a bomber that's going to take, take on some of the workload from three separate fleets, which makes it just as, if not more important. Great. Rebecca. Yes, and here's the one option the B-21 has to give the president, and that is to say, yes, we can fly the B-21 in past the defenses in this very tough environment and can carry out direct attack. That means get that bomber and its payload closer to the target so that the weapon can hit the mobile target before it goes too far. Cruise missiles just take too long to fly there and have some vulnerability issues. Or 
that B21 gets close enough so that you have the boom necessary to hit a hardened, deeply buried target and to do restrike if necessary. That's that crucial direct attack role that is going to fall really on the shoulders of the B-21. The president has to have it. Right. And at the same time, it's stealthy. Um, and so I've, I've heard some people say, well, if it's stealthy, is that going to be the thing that's driving up costs? When you look at its predecessor, is that what made that aircraft be too so incredibly expensive? Um, just briefly, uh, I, I think it's been debunked a couple in a couple of different pretty serious studies, but but it, but just to just for the sake of our our viewers now, it isn't the stealth, correct? I mean, that's not that's not been the driving factor um, of aircraft in general. It's it's the number of buys in the fleet, correct? And we can get the sort of the cost per aircraft down. Um, if so, if you only have twenty one B twos, that's going to make the aircraft per for operating and sustaining the aircraft more expensive per per craft than if you were to say have one hundred and fifty. No question, the number one cost driver is how many you buy and how long you take to buy them. Underneath that, you've got software and a couple other factors, but the number one cost driver is unit quantity and time in the program. And so those are the decisions that policymakers really have to be making now as they think about um, buying these things, what those requirements are, something that we need to do in this two-peer environment. And then the last point I think is really important is something Carrie has touched on too, this, I just, this, this, the theme of giving the president more options um, and something that the air leg and the B-21 specifically contribute is um, being able to have this versatility in, in what weapons it, the, the pilot chooses demonstrating resolve, but then also restraint so that you've got these options. You can, you can, you can carry out a particular mission and then also demonstrate to our adversary, you know, that that it's not going to prevail if it continues, but that the United States can still sort of pull back and be restrained in what else it continues to do. Something that's unique to the air leg of the triad versus um, the land leg of the triad, for instance, if anybody else wants to comment on, on just that particular um, attribute. Yep, Carrie. No, I, said, I want to pick up what Rebecca just said is there is such flexibility in this platform. So it's flexibility of where it comes from and where it can go, what, what it can penetrate with its stealthy capability. But there's also an immense amount of flexibility in the payload. So I really liked her point about this is a platform. It can carry weapons that may not be as survivable, but as long as you can get it in, penetrate those air defenses, get it in the mainland and drop targets, um, you still can have or drop weapon on target, you can still have an effect. And I think that open architecture that has been it's been designed to be from the get go helps here that I think is unique to to this 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 weapon system as well as you know others mother other modern systems that are coming down the pike is it allows for adaptability of different weapons in the inventory or maybe ones that are still to come. Wonderful, Jennifer. I will give you the last word before we close out. Um, just on this idea of the demonstration of restraint, I think I would phrase it in a different way. Um, there's always the concern that if you try to demonstrate restraint, it will be misinterpreted as potentially weakness by the adversaries. But what the B-21 does, I think, is um, make that escalation ladder larger. And so it provides the United States more steps as we go up that escalation ladder so that we can achieve some of those escalation objectives, potentially at the convention level, leaving the more room for the president to escalate further if necessary. And I think that is what's truly important with this particular platform. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much for your contributions, your analysis, your hard work on this. And I hope that you will, um, for those watching at home, uh, check out the published report that will be coming out in just a couple of weeks in December. Thank you so much.